and welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the second workshop in our Gene Educator series. So thank you so much for being here this evening. I am Nancy Coddington. I am the Director of Science Content at WSKG Public Media. And we are so pleased to be able to partner with the Master Teacher Program, Room Tiger Boses, SUNY Cortland, the Science Teachers Association of New York State to bring you this great series of workshops throughout the month. Uh, we started this series in the early part of the month with a screening of Ken Burns, The Gene and Intimate History, which you can also find the full version of that on PBS Learning Media. We are going to be using a lot of resources today. Uh, you will be provided with links, also the slide deck of uh, the presentation so that you have those resources available to you. Don, can you go ahead and advance it to the next slide? And as I mentioned, we are using Ken Burns, The Gene and Intimate History, which is a four hour long series diving into genetics, looking at, at everything from eugenics to CRISPR technology. And we've been walking through that journey together. Today, we're gonna to be talking about genome editing and CRISPR. Uh, we have some great presenters today. We have uh, Dominic Fanicone and Dr. Jeff Radloff, they're going to be presenting. And we have some amazing guest speakers that are going to be spending the afternoon with us as well. We're really pleased to have you here. Thank you. And as I mentioned, the content that we are using, you can find all of this on PBS Learning Media. We will be providing those links for you. And the whole point of this is to be able to point you in the direction of content that you can bring right into your classroom with your students. And we are going to have time today to actually use some of this on how you would be pulling that into your classroom with these activities. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our presenters for today, uh, Dom Panicone and Jeff Radloff. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nancy. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, for those that don't know me, Dom Panicone, I am the uh, Central New York Regional Director for the New York State Master Teacher Program. And I'm also the current president of the Science Teachers Association of New York State. So we're really excited to be partnering with WSKG and BOCES to um, make this uh, workshop series available for you. Many thank you to all of our partners. Um, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself quick? So I'm Jeff Randloff. I'm an assistant professor at SUNY Cortland. I teach the senior uh, elementary science methods course um, and also welcome everybody. All right, so we are going to start right off with an activity um, and let me click here. And we are going to start with a couple of poll questions. And so the first poll question says, imagine you've been offered a deal from a genomics company. You can get a free genome sequence, an analysis of all your DNA that includes a report of your ancestry, traits, and a medical profile. The medical profile tells you about diseases for which you have a low risk of getting and also those you have a high risk of getting. So are you interested in finding out? So go ahead and click yes or no. We'll give you about a few seconds to get your entries in. Yeah, we've got about 64 people have voted or 64% at this point. And this is anonymous, so nobody can see how you voted. And go ahead and decide, because I'm going to go ahead and close this out in just a moment. I think almost everybody has voted. I'm going to end the poll now, and I'm going to share those results. Perfect. So it looks like 63% of you said yes, you would be interested in finding out, 17% or no, and 19% of you are not sure. So. If you're interested in discussing why you chose the answer you did, feel free to either unmute yourself or pop that in the chat window. We'd love to hear what you're thinking. <laughs> I should like the free part. <laughs> Perfect. So some curiosity, okay. for pre preventative measures. Ah, that's interesting. I wonder who else would have access to it. Is this one of those things there, once it's out there, it's out for anyone to have access to. I 
if I have actionable genes, I'd like to adjust my lifestyle. I'd like to find the gene that would prevent the COVID 20 pounds that I got. <laughs> Get ahead of troubles, good point. Yeah, Rich, that's a, Rick, that's a good point. So I only put no because I'm wondering other what other people would have access to it. Um, you know, would employers miss you know abuse the information if they had access to it and not hire someone? No more medical insurance for you. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. A lot of interesting answers in the chat, and we'll save this chat and um, and look at this later. So we're going to go to this next poll question, which builds off of poll question number one. So poll question number two says, well, for the first 100 volunteers, the company is going to uh, is offering to correct several of the disease related genes found by the analysis. Imagine this were a very new procedure approved by the government for safety, but without a great deal of long term study. This kind of feels like something we're going through right now <laughs> where we can maybe cure uh, or prevent uh, COVID, um, but it's a very new procedure. So go ahead and enter your thoughts for this poll question. Oh, I see we're using the same poll question, but that's okay. It's just still yes, no, not sure. Oh, it says number one, but it is number two. Okay. <laughs> Confusing. Okay, I think we're almost there. This if you haven't voted, go ahead and cast your vote. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and I'm gonna share results. So a lot more people were interested in finding out what's wrong with them than getting it fixed. I'm interested to hear your thoughts in the chat window. Go ahead, please. Why did you select? For most of you, no, we're not sure. <laughs> Libby says, I'm all about a, being a guinea pig. The value of the <laughs> If fix. I can help Matt. <laughs> I've had plenty of good years. Uh, depends on the severity and age of the disease. Sure, once the onset of it. Alan says, if it was a matter of life or death, significant quality of life issues. So maybe like a last ditch effort. I'm not gonna be your testing ground unless already seriously afflicted. Yeah, depends on the type of disorder. Good point, John. Need more testing for me to feel comfortable. But these may be questions we need to start answering for ourselves, which is interesting to be thinking about. So we are going to uh, start with a short clip from the gene, um, which uh, is kind of provides an introduction to gene therapy and our topic for tonight. So it's about three and a half minutes. So sit back and relax and uh, see you in three and a half minutes. In 1987, a researcher discovered that some bacteria incorporate short pieces of viral DNA into their own. The University of California's Jennifer Doudna was one of the scientists who wondered why. I love mysteries, and I love puzzles. I mean, I think that's why I became a scientist. I, I love the idea that I spend my life trying to figure things out. And the mystery here was a lot of bacteria store pieces of viral DNA in their chromosome, in their own DNA. They grab these little bits of viral DNA, insert it into the genetic material of themselves, and then keep it for future use. So why? Doudna and others determined that the bacteria are actually using the viral DNA to recognize future attacks. The system is known by its acronym, CRISPR. 
I kind of liken CRISPRs to biometric identification systems where you might store fingerprints or retinal scans as a way to be able to recognize specific individuals in the future. Bacteria are doing the same thing, but they're storing little snippets of DNA from viruses in their own genetic material. But bacteria don't just identify their viral attackers by those snippets of DNA. They also devised a way of destroying them. At a conference in Puerto Rico, Doudna and a French colleague, Emmanuel Charpentier, agreed to collaborate. And together, they eventually figured out how bacteria do it. CRISPR can be regarded as uh, programmable molecular scissors. So scissors uh, that will be programmed to recognize a certain specific sequence on the genomes of virtually any cell and organism will be able to cut uh, this DNA at a very specific place. The CRISPR systems in bacteria are really a seek and destroy kind of system. They have molecules whose job is to detect that foreign DNA and recognize it as, as a virus. And then in the second step, CRISPR molecules cut it up. It was then that Doudna and Charpentier made a conceptual leap that would change the history of science. Would it be possible, they wondered, to extract CRISPR from bacteria and take control of its guidance system? In other words, could they re-engineer CRISPR into a simple tool for editing any kind of DNA at any spot they chose? After years of tinkering, they got their idea to work. So effectively, they realized this little molecular machine, they could program it with any DNA. And basically, that's why it's so amazing. If you know a DNA sequence in an organism, you can change that gene. CRISPR is biology's super Swiss army knife. It seems to be able to do just about everything, and it can do it faster, cheaper, more accurately, more easily than anything that came before it. All right. Are you able to see my slideshow again? Okay. Um, so at this point, um, I am going to turn it over to Jeff, who's going to introduce CRISPR a little more for us. Thanks. And so after watching the video, uh, we kind of start thinking about this question, right, of what is CRISPR? Uh, and so in the past decade, uh, scientists have begun to develop techniques known as genome editing um, that allow them to make changes to what are called uh, target um, sites on the genome. So these specific sections of DNA. Um, and so one of these techniques that actually won the Nobel Prize last year in chemistry is uh, CRISPR. Um, and so CRISPR actually stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, uh, not a mouthful at all. Um, and as we saw in the gene, uh, CRISPR is, is basically akin to being a primitive immune system that bacteria use to protect themselves against viruses. Um, and so recently, scientists have been able to take components of this system and use it experimentally in uh, human and animal models. Um, and so uh, more generally, uh, genome editing techniques such as CRISPR can be used to do one of two things. Um, so you can see them there. They can be utilized to uh, make a gene non-functional. Um, so for example, uh, you know, turning off a gene that causes cancer growth. Um, and then they can also be used to replace a version of a gene with another that works. Um, so for example, maybe we're replacing a broken copy with a working copy. Um, and so along these same lines uh, is really how CRISPR works. So making cuts to the DNA at the certain sites and then um, essentially uh, replacing what's there. Um, and so the question kind of then becomes, what are the potential applications of CRISPR to human health? And so one of the main applications uh, is gene therapy or using genetic technology to really directly treat a lot of these diseases. Um, and some diseases such as cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia are um, 
known to be caused by mutations to a single gene um, or variants in single genes. Um, and so if the disease causing gene can be corrected or replaced, um, then the hope is really that we can cure these diseases or at least prevent it uh, from worsening. Um, however, this is more difficult when we think about more complex diseases. So if we think about uh, diabetes or cancer, um, those kind of have to do with interplay among many genes um, in between the genes in the environment. Um, and so this type of therapy has been going on since the 90s. Um, and so far, there's a limited number of treatments available, um, which uh, a lot of them have to do with um, adding a new or an extra copy of a gene. Um, but with these advances and with CRISPR, um, you know, we can actually directly alter an individual's original copies of the gene. Um, and then uh, scientists are also working with uh, animal models. And so researchers have also used genome editing uh, within uh, mice. So you can see the mice here, um, which is really an important step in the research process towards applying CRISPR in humans. Um, so, for example, uh, here they've treated this disease, a liver disease called type 1 tyrosinemia, um, which affects essentially 1 in 100,000 people um, and is caused by a mutation in a single gene called FAH. Um, and so in the people with the disease, uh, they have trouble breaking down certain amino acids, uh, which leads eventually to liver failure. Um, but in this case, scientists were actually able to inject the mice with uh, the CRISPR system and a working copy of the FAH gene um, that when it replaced the non-working copies actually cured the disease. Um, and so while this treatment hasn't been tested in humans uh, and trials aren't underway, uh, this concept of replacing a piece of DNA could lead to really profound improvements um, you know, in patients with these often fatal genetic disorders. Um, so that was kind of an overview uh, about CRISPR. So now that we have kind of a baseline for what CRISPR is, uh, how it works and what it can be used for, um, I wanna go ahead and introduce our main speakers for tonight, uh, Jenna Klingerman and Chenin Lee. Uh, both Jenna and Chenin are researchers from the Kaczynski Cancer Lab at Purdue University. Uh, where they have engaged in research focused on applying CRISPR to uh, lung cancer models. Um, which they are going to be sharing with you all right now. So thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Jenna Klingerman, and I'm really excited to be here uh, with Shannon. And we're really excited to talk to you more about some applications of the CRISPR-Cas9 system, specifically in cancer research. So just a little bit of background about me. Um, yes, I was a previous member of Dr. Andrea Kaczynski's lab at Purdue University. And I decided uh, after being in the lab for almost two years to combine my love for science with education. And I'm now studying science education at Purdue. Um, Chenin is still a member of the Kaczynski lab and he is almost done with his PhD. And so just to give you a quick overview of our presentation, um, we're just gonna give a brief review to start out of CRISPR-Cas9 and its applications in scientific research. Um, and then we're going to spend the majority of our time really focusing on our lab's focus, uh, which is CRISPR-Cas9 applications in cancer research. And so I'm going to be profiling a CRISPR-Cas9 screen uh, that we did in cell culture to identify genes that are involved in drug resistance in lung cancer. And then Chenin is going to be talking about applications of CRISPR in animal models in cancer. And we will close with some important takeaways that we hope you take with you as well as um, some resources for you to help make connections between what we're talking about and the applications of CRISPR-Cas9 in research uh, to your classrooms uh, for your students. And so with this, I just wanna give a brief overview of just some key terms that Jeff and Dom did a really great job introducing as well as the video that you just watched. Um, so just a reminder, uh, CRISPR stands for clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, definitely a mouthful. Um, and you can really think of these as just specialized regions of DNA that contain nucleotide repeats and spacers. And so in this diagram, you can see uh, the repeats are denoted in yellow and spacers in blue. 
Um, and these are made up of nucleotides, which just to remind you the basic structure of a nucleotide, uh, you have a nitrogenous base, a sugar and phosphate group. And so that's just a brief overview of CRISPR. In addition, another important term that you'll want to remember is Cas9. And this is a specialized protein. It's an enzyme that acts like molecular scissors and can actually cut the DNA at very specific locations. And so you can see here in this image, you have the Cas9 protein um, in orange, and you can see that it's made a cut at a very specific spot in the DNA. And so from this, uh, this is how genome editing can be possible. And finally, uh, the last term you'll want to remember is a single guide RNA, which is basically a very short RNA that will define your genomic target to be edited. And so um, what scientists actually did, as you can see in the last figure that I just pulled up, is they actually combined two different forms of RNA. Um, one is called CRISPR RNA, so that's the CR RNA. And then there's also tracer RNA. And they synthetically combined these to form the single guide. RNA. And the single guide RNA is very important because it is what allows the Cas9 protein to come in and make the cut at that specific DNA target. And so with this in mind, I also just wanted to remind you about the CRISPR technology that was adapted from the natural defense mechanisms of bacteria. And so bacteria are able to use this to destroy invading viral uh, attacks, as you can see in this figure. Um, however, what's really remarkable is that scientists were able to realize um, that these CRISPR components, if they are placed in more complex organisms, such as humans, can do genome editing. And so that's what we're really going to be talking about today. And so just to give you a brief overview of how the CRISPR-Cas9 system works uh, to do genome editing, you can see here in this figure that you have a Cas9 protein in the top, that yellow orange structure. And there's a, a single guide RNA in green that will direct the Cas9 to a specific spot in the DNA. And there, uh, the Cas9 will be able to cut the DNA and create what's called a double strand break. And when this happens, the cell is gonna try to repair the break. And so depending on the repair mechanism used, um, it can either introduce mutations that will make that gene non-functional um, if it uses the process called non-homologous end joining. However, if it uses a different repair mechanism called homology-directed repair, you can actually incorporate a new functional gene. So if you know of a, a defective gene that's causing a certain disease like cystic fibrosis or even in cancer, you could actually use this technique to introduce a new functional gene that could lead to cures for human disease. And so with this, uh, we're really gonna jump into our focus, uh, which is cancer research. Um, so our lab primarily uh, does lung cancer research and also prostate cancer research. But for today, uh, we'll be focusing on lung cancer. And so one application um, that we have done in our lab is using these screens uh, to look for genes that are involved in drug resistance and lung cancer. And so you can use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to do what's called a knockout screen, which is an experimental approach to identify important genes that are involved in a specific process or elicit a specific function in the cell. And so for example, uh, we'll be talking about drug resistance in cancer. And these screens can be done in both cell culture models in animals. Um, the example that I'm gonna be giving will be within human cells, uh, human cancer cells. And so I also just want to give you a brief overview of how this screening process works before we jump in to the research example. And so first, what you want to do is you want to identify all of the potential uh, gene targets that you're interested in. So for us, it may be genes that we think that are involved in resistance and lung cancer. And then once you're able to identify all the genes that you think may be involved in a specific process, you're going to design um, oligonucleotides or oligopoles for short. And these are just short RNA molecules um, that will use to encode the single guide RNAs that will eventually be directed to a specific gene inside the cell and then be able to knock out that gene. And so once you do that, um, researchers, what they'll do is they'll wanna deliver uh, those single guide RNA or oligonucleotide libraries to the cells and to do this, uh, they use lentiviruses. 
Um, so they actually use a lentivirus to introduce uh, the single guide RNAs into the cells. And so once uh, the cells are infected with the lentiviruses containing the oligonucleotides, um, then that's when the CRISPR-mediated knockout of a specific gene can take place. And so in the case of our research, if you're looking at drug resistance, um, what you'll want to do after uh, the cells uptake, the lentiviruses incorporate the single guide RNAs into their genomes and allow for that knockout of specific genes to occur, um, you'll want to treat a, set of, a subset of those cells with the drug that you're interested in. And so for us, we were able to do that. And then once you treat with drug, you will allow those cells to grow and then do next generation sequencing to be able to determine um, your genes of interest that may be involved in drug resistance. On the other hand, I will also mention that you'll also want to establish a baseline or a control um, to compare your screening results against. And so that's also really important to this screening process. So now that I've kind of gone through this, um, I'm gonna jump more into our research focus, which is lung cancer. And so obviously lung cancer is a very big problem. It is currently the leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States in both men and women. Um, you can see that at the bottom of this figure. In addition to this, uh, lung cancer is the second most common cancer in both men and women for estimated new cases. And this is based on 2020 data. Um, and this is a very prevalent and ongoing problem. And so with lung cancer, um, there's two different types of lung cancer that a person can get. And so one is non-small cell lung cancer, which makes up 85% of all lung cancer cases. So that's the majority. And then you have small cell lung cancer, which only makes up a very small percent. And our lab was really focused on non-small cell lung cancer. And so what scientists have been able to determine over time is different uh, causal mutations in different genes or different components of the cell that actually cause cancer. And so what they discovered in non-small cell lung cancer is that 15 to 35% of non-small cell lung cancer patients develop mutations in a specific receptor on their cells called EGFR or the epidermal growth factor receptor. And scientists have been able to develop a treatment for this called erlotinib. Uh, but before I talk about erlotinib, I just wanna give you a little bit more background about the EGFR or the epidermal growth factor receptor. And so this receptor in normal cells is really important to cell survival and cell growth. And so as you can see in this figure, um, you'll have different uh, orange ligands in this case will bind to the receptor and that will activate the receptor or turn it on. And once the receptor is turned on, it will dimerize and then lead to downstream signaling pathways that ultimately result in cell division and uh, cell survival. And so in normal cells, this can be a very good thing as it is important for our cells to continue to divide and replace old cells. However, in cancer, this receptor becomes what scientists call constitutively active. And what that means is that it's always on. So you can kind of think of it like a light switch that you leave on, but you can never turn off. And so in this case, this light switch or this receptor is always on, which basically means that these signaling pathways are just happening over and over, which leads to the cells just continuing to divide out of control. And in the case of non-small cell lung cancer, there's been two of what are called activating mutations that have caused this. And so these two mutations that you can see on the slide actually cause this receptor to be turned on all the time. However, erlotinib uh, blocks this. And so it helps uh, the cells not divide and it keeps the cancer at bay and keeps it from growing out of control. However, the problem is that within a year, over half of these patients that go on to erlotinib develop resistance to the drug. And this is often due to secondary mutations. And so there's one listed here on the screen. And so this has become a really large uh, research area of interest uh, for cancer researchers um, to understand what causes this resistance or what genes are involved in this resistance. And so uh, although there have been a number of mutations and different genes that have been identified uh, that have caused this resistance, 
there are still about 15 to 20 percent of mechanisms that are unknown. And so that led to our lab to ask a research question of can we identify other novel mediators of erlotinib resistance in non-small cell lung cancer? And this became a really large question um, for one of our fellow lab members, Dr. Arpita Powell. Um, she has now finished her PhD, but this really drove her PhD research while she was at Purdue. And I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to work with her and help her out with her project. And so she really had this question and to figure out what genes were involved, she conducted a CRISPR-Cas9 knockout screen. And so what she did was she identified um, genes that she thought were involved in erlotinib resistance and non-small cell lung cancer. And she was able to generate a single guide RNA a lentiviral library um, to this and then introduce these single guide RNAs into um, lung cancer cells uh, that were already expressing the Cas9 protein. And this is really important because you need both the single guide RNA and the Cas9 protein for the genome editing to work. And so once she was able to transduce the single guide RNAs into the Cas9 expressing lung cancer cells, um, she then was able to uh, have genome editing happen. And so basically what would happen is the cells would uptake the single guide RNA, which would then get incorporated into that cell's genome and then be directed to a specific gene that would then get knocked out. And so after that, she wanted to select for the cells that had successfully uptaken the single guide RNAs and knocked out their genes. Um, after this, she wanted to treat those with the drug, so with erlotinib, um, and let them continue to grow at which point um, you wanna isolate the genomic DNA or GDNA for short, and then prepare libraries to do the next generation sequencing, um, followed by some bioinformatic analysis uh, to identify genes that may be involved in erlotinib resistance. And so from this screen and analysis, Arpita was able to determine um, a top hit from this screen, which is called SUV420H2. And I know many of you are probably like, what is SUV for 20H2? I've never heard of this. And so just to give you a little bit of background on SUV for 20H2, um, in normal cells, this is involved in regulating gene expression. And it does this through putting a specific mark on the DNA, a specific methylation mark. And this mark helps DNA stay in its condensed form and keeps genes turned off. And so this can be good. Um, because in cancer, as you'll see in a minute, um, if you do not have SUV present, it can turn on genes that cause cancer. And so here you can see in the cancer model, oftentimes in many cancers, including lung cancer, SUV 420H2 um, is not present. And so therefore this mark does not get put on the DNA and it leads to turning on of genes that can cause cancer called oncogenes. And so this was really um, big for us to be able to use this screen and identify, uh, for our PETA to identify um, SUV420H2. Another important step for her after completing the screen was to do some validation studies to make sure that this was indeed a true target. And so she was able to validate this finding and then do further studies to understand how SUV420H2 actually causes erlotinib resistance and non-small cell lung cancer. And so with this example, um, I'm going to turn it over to Chen and Lee to give you some examples um, in animal models. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Chen Nen. And um, so Chen has just talked about um, the use of CRISPR in the cell culture system. And I'm not going to talk about um, um, its use in the animal models. And, uh, and the main reason for doing CRISPR in the animal models um, is that um, if you think about the therapeutics for a human patient, uh, you have to find out a more realistic in vivo environment to uh, simulate this human condition. So that's where uh, animal models uh, come into the place. And um, that's really why we also want to use animal models to find out critical genes and therapeutic targets using the CRISPR. So, um, so, so now uh, let me talk about first, uh, what are the animal models that people use in the field um, for uh, the CRISPR screening or um, any um, therapeutic applications? So there are uh, mainly three models uh, that we use. 
So the first and the most direct one um, is called patient-derived xenograft model. Um, you can also um, call it as PDX model. And so as the name suggests, uh, you're just taking the uh, disease from a human patient, such as a tumor, and then you take it out and implant it into an, uh, a mouse host. Um, and this mouse um, is always the uh, immunocompromised mouse, which lacks the immunity, so that tumors can grow in that uh, place. Uh, and then you can study the role of a gene, like a gene or a gene knockout, or a small molecule drug uh, on the tumor formation from this patient background. So why do we use these models? As I just said, um, it's really mainly uh, used for searching patient-specific therapeutic targets and specifically this precision medicine theory. Um, and we wanted to find out the right uh, uh, right genes and the right drugs for the patient based on its genetic background or um, uh, its um, health status. So this is a great model for finding out these uh, precision, precision medicine. And so the second model also uses this immunocompromised mouse host, but now you're not taking any patient-derived uh, diseases um, and you're simply using these uh, pretty established uh, cancer cell lines. Um, from a large collection uh, that are shared by uh, many scientists. And so um, what I mean by saying, these, uh, by saying this established uh, cancer cell line is that these cells are well characterized um, for its genomic information and also for its um, cellular behaviors. Um, so we know a lot about um, their uh, growth properties and uh, their tumor formation potential. Um, so, so we can simply study um, of a gene or um, a, a drug's effect in this pretty um, well-established uh, cell system. And so we can use that to simply validate tumorigenic potential in the, really the fastest and easiest way um, through this uh, xenograft models. And so the last model system I'm talking about here uh, is quite different. Uh, it does not involve implantation of any human cells or uh, mouse cells, but it is totally uh, driven by a, a set of genetic mutations. So, and this is called genetically engineered uh, models or transgenic models. And again, um, so as the name suggests, it is really um, uh, driven by a, a single or a single genetic mutation and that causes the entire formation um, or entire course of the tumor formation in an in vivo system. And so the benefit of this model is that um, you now have an intact immunity instead of a uh, immunocompromised system. And so um, also you, a great thing about this model is that you can induce the genetic mutation at any specific time point during the course of the uh, tumor formation. So, and so that you can really uh, try to understand um, if your therapeutics uh, is effective at late stage or early stage. And so why I'm, did I mention these animal models before I really talk about any CRISPR stuff? Uh, because when you think about CRISPR, you have to think about how, do you, how you would use it, right? It has to be uh, a question and that is addressed in an uh, animal system or ultimately in human being. Um, so that's why uh, selecting and right animal model is the uh, key to the success of the uh, research in here. So that's why um, I want to kind of go through these um, things. So uh, in, in the next few slides, I'm going to show you some examples um, of using these models in the real research to help us identify some critical therapeutic targets for human lung cancer. And so the first example um, that we're uh, seeing here is using a cancer cell and xenograft, which I described uh, briefly. So the cell lines I'm um, using here is called KELO6, um, which is a human lung carcinoma cell line. Um, and as you can see, um, after implantation in a immunocompromised nude mice, it can readily form this um, aggressive tumor. And um, so it is definitely a pretty um, well-established tumor genic cell line uh, from a human, originally from a human lung cancer patient. Um, so the question I'm asking here is that uh, if there is any genes that uh, these tumor depend upon, so basically, in another way is that if we knock out this gene in this tumor, um, uh, are, we're expecting them to cause a complete tumor regression. So these genes can be um, used as therapeutic targets. 
uh, for future treatment. So uh, in order to find out these critical genetic dependencies or genes depend upon, um, we perform this CRISPR screen um, called a negative screen. So Jenna has just talked about a positive screen, which means you find out something that shows you the phenotype. But now the negative screen means that when you, uh, when you knock out a gene, the phenotype disappear or tumor disappear. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, so still, again, we, we are using this CRISPR um, in a uh, library of the single guide RNAs to create those, um, a, a pool, large pool of the mutant cells. And so each color code or each circle shown here indicates a cell with a different mutation. So each color indicates a different mutation created by uh, different sets of the single guide RNA. And so um, what we did was we, we simply implant this pool of the uh, mutant cells into the uh, immunocompromised mouse host. And then after a month, we collected the tumors and then we sequenced for the RNAs from them. And as you can see, the red cells and yellow cells disappear um, after this in vivo selection. Basically, they are uh, missing in this resulting tumor, which could suggest that uh, the mutations um, that are being carried in these uh, red and yellow cells um, makes tumor not able to form or basically uh, uh, enables them um, to grow in in vivo. And you may also question that um, there might be also some mutations um, in, in these missing cells. There are also um, hitting on some essential genes, um, such as those um, involved in gene expression, making your proteins, or really basic metabolism, without which you can simply kill the cells, right? But we don't want to really target normal cells and normal life processes, right? We don't want to really interfere with our normal tissues. Um, so then that really comes in. So then this in really comes in uh, to address that um, concern. And so, so we, what we really wanted to do is that we wanted to piece out these um, essential genes from the list of um, these candidate um, genes. And the way we do it is simply just culture those um, a pool of mutant cells in an, uh, cell culture for some time. And then um, any genes or any mutations that leads to uh, uh, in the inability to cell survival will be missing, right? And then we can identify them out. And this is how, so in this case, if you look at the yellow cells that is missing in the uh, in vitro selection, then you can easily tell that the genes um, being hit in these yellow cells are indeed the essential genes, right? So then um, basically you can simply tell that these um, gene A targeted by the yellow uh, the single guide RNAs in these yellow cells are essential genes. And then this uh, gene B uh, targeted by the single guide RNA in these red cells are our therapeutic targets. Okay, so with that in mind, I wanna show you some data that we collected throughout um, this experiment and to really show you um, the power of the screening in identifying uh, potential therapeutic targets. So as I mentioned, there are two categories of genes that we can identify through these in vitro versus in vivo selection experiment. And the first list is the essential genes I, that we can identify from the in vitro selection experiment. And mostly you can see from here are involved in um, some really essential um, processes like protein synthesis, energy, energy production, and uh, cell division, cell cycles, and uh, DNA transcription. So um, if you um, knock out these genes, um, you're expecting to um, simply kill the cells, even uh, in a cell culture. And the second category is the, um, is the genes that we're interested in and are relevant to the clinics, uh, which are the potential therapeutic targets. So remember, these genes were identified simply by extracting the uh, genes identified from the in vivo by those essential genes, right? So, and if you look at these um, genes and uh, which pathways they're mostly involved in, you can find out several uh, cancer signalings in multiple different cancers because many of them are sharing the similar um, signaling um, uh, pathways. And then some are involved in gene expression, such as P53, which I'll also talk about in a few minutes, um, and some transcription factors. 
um, and also the DNA repair mechanisms, such as homologous uh, recombination, which is also an, um, an important thing in the uh, many cancer types. So the data is pretty, um, um, is pretty promising, and we're currently uh, validating these targets and trying to figure out the mechanisms that leads to these uh, cancer, um, cancer cell uh, progression and maintenance. So now I want to kind of switch gears to a second, um, a second uh, example, which involves the use of the transgenic mouse model, uh, which I described the last uh, in that page. And just a reminder, uh, so this model is uh, driven, or basically disease from this model is driven by the genetics, driven by the genes. Right. So, um, so, 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 if you think about lung cancer, you want, you want really to look at uh, major drivers of the lung cancer uh, from human patients, and we know that uh, these two genes called KRAS and uh, P53 are the two of the most commonly mutated genes in lung cancer, and so, and they are also well recognized for their um, role in um, causing uh, this cancer formation process, and so this figure might be very familiar to many of you um, and which Jenna has just showed you know, a few minutes ago. Um, she was talking about this epidermal growth factor receptor um, uh, and this chart is really showing you uh, the percent of the uh, lung cancer cases uh, that are involved these different mutations. So now I'm not talking about this EGFR mutation, I'm really focusing on this um, KRAS mutation. Right, it takes up about 22% uh, of all cases. And an interesting fact is that P53 mutations are um, often coexisting with the KRAS mutations. So uh, this is really why we want to focus on these two genes uh, and to use a model to address some uh, question about lung cancer. So again, about these genes, uh, K the KRAS is, an, uh, is, is, is a gene um, called an oncogene, which means uh, it can promote cancer. Um, and a P53 is actually a, a tumor suppressor gene. And the most mutation that you can find um, for the P53 is uh, a loss of function mutation, basically um, losing is tumor suppressor activity in the cancer. And if you really uh, think about our cell, like a cancer, uh, actually our cell as a car um, on the road, um, then this oncogene KRAS uh, can be envisioned as a gas pedal, which allows you to speed up. Um, whereas this tumor suppressor P53 uh, can be regarded as the brake, which allows you to stop it. Right, so think about if you drive your car and if you uh, have some trouble with your gas pedal and you, if you can't really, if you, if you really can't control your brake, then you're likely gonna run into a car crash or something like a cancer, full-blown cancer that you're expecting to have, right? So uh, this is really the mechanism that leads to cancer uh, driven by these mutations. Okay, so in order to simulate uh, these genetic changes in a mouse model. Um, we use this uh, mouse model called uh, KRAS G12B, basically it's a mutated KRAS um, and P53 uh, flux mouse model. So in this case, uh, we are, are triggering the activation of this KRAS mutation, the oncogene, and then we are also having this loss of function mutation of the uh, P53 um, and so kind of to simulate this genetic um, um, background to trigger the tumor formation. And so the way we do this in the experiment is that we simply uh, deliver a virus that can trigger these genetic um, outcomes through this process called intratracheal interstellation. So basically you're delivering these viruses directly to the lung epithelium in the mouse. So to really um, induce these genetic changes and ultimately induce tumor formation. And so in three months, uh, we are expecting to see a full-blown lung um, adenocarcinoma um, shown like this. And so um, that really um, is the uh, outcome of this genetic event. And so uh, by showing this, I want, want you to really appreciate that um, we now have a model that is triggered by just genetic mutations. Um, and you can also induce different kind of genetic knockouts where you can deliver the drug at different time points during the development and or the tumor formation.
function to really study the role of the gene um, versus um, the effect of the drug in the uh, lung, for, lung tumor formation. And so then how can we use CRISPR in this model? Um, so you can simply um, let the Cas9 to be expressed in this lung, um, and then you deliver the single guide RNA through virus uh, into this uh, lung area and to induce genes or uh, replace a gene, um, or you can apply the small molecule drugs in the same system to, um, to, to address the question. Precise that not only can you use CRISPR to study the cancer biology or this um, uh, cancer process, um, you can also use it to study many different kinds of um, human diseases um, as we kind of have um, have, have, have been looking in that video, you can also uh, study diseases in your brain, in the immune system, or many different tissues, as long as the model system that you select is appropriate and can address your question. Um, in a, wait a second, in a particular, <laughs> um, particular point here is that, um, I would say is that the model system that you use can really give you a similar um, um, disease pathology or um, a feature that is very similar to the human counterpart. So you're uh, confident about using that and to address some um, therapeutic related questions. All right. So um, in summary, uh, I really hope that through um, we, our um, talk, uh, by me and Jenna, uh, you can um, appreciate that CRISPR can create mutations at your desired genes, not only knockout, but also different kind of um, uh, mutations like insertions or replacement of the gene. Uh, and genetic screens in cell culture or animal models using CRISPR can allow you to uh, find out these genes that are causal or essential to a uh, biological or uh, disease process. Uh, and also, I really want to emphasize this, um, is that a CRISPR is also a way to identify novel therapeutics for cancer research, uh, for cancer in other diseases, uh, which we have uh, not had um, right now. Uh, and then we also hope that you can appreciate the power that this technology has on biomedical research and will be more comfortable in showing these knowledge and uh, experience to your student in your classroom. And with that, I wanted to um, turn this back to Jenna um, to talk about some uh, application in the classroom. Thank you, Chenin. Um, yeah, so uh, from this presentation, uh, we also hope that you will be able to make connections between CRISPR uses and research and your classroom. And so I have created a couple of resources for you, um, which I believe Jeff will be placing all these links in the chat as well. Um, you will also have access to this presentation, um, and so you can also find the links through the presentation as well. And so I did create a CRISPR-Cas9 and other biological key terms handout, as obviously there's lots of terminology that needs to be introduced when you're teaching um, students about CRISPR-Cas9 and its applications in research. Um, I also created some lesson plan uh, resources based off of, I tried to align um, this content with the Next Generation Science Standards. And so you'll find a couple tables there for middle and high school curriculum, as well as some example lesson ideas um, from this presentation. Again, you will have access to this presentation. And also if you're more curious um, about our research, um, Chenin and Dr. Kaczynski have published a beautiful review about uses of animal models uh, and different genome editing techniques in animal models, um, as well as a research paper that I'm a co-author on um, that was uh, first authored by uh, Dr. Arpita Powell um, in her research. And so with this, um, we really would like to thank you for your time and your attention. Um, I'd like to point out the bolded names on the slide are those most uh, instrumental to the research, particularly Dr. Arpita Powell, Chenin, and Alejandra. Um, we also have provided our contact information. If you have further questions later on or after today, um, you can always reach out to us uh, by our emails. And so with that, thank you again. And do you have any questions? All right, Jenna, Jenna thank you so, so much. Really appreciate uh, your presentation. And once you see the resources that Jenna put together, you're gonna be totally impressed. She did a ton of work, so we really appreciate that. There's time for a few questions and feel free to pop those into the chat. And Jenna and Chenin, there's been a little bit of conversation going on in the chat already. 
about HIV virus. Um, and if someone's infected with that, could CRISPR potentially be used to cure it? That's a great question. Um, I think that's also a um, really important application of the CRISPR in the, um, this field. Um, although I haven't really looked into this um, um, application in detail, but um, I, I'm um, like when you are having this uh, HIV infection, it should I mean your viral genome is the viral genome is integrated into the host um, immune cells, and then um, so. So that makes sense that you can correct, or basically you can remove the um, viral genome so that it, the immune cell will not be making the viral proteins anymore. Um, I think there are some, I believe there are some concerns in editing these um, cells and, and these genes. So, but yeah, this is, I think this is still open to discussion. Uh, Keith asks, how does CRISPR-Cas9 get delivered specifically to a particular organ or type of cell? Yeah, so... Go ahead, Chad. <laughs> sure. Um, so as we have shown in our presentation, so um, in our um, cell culture system, uh, you can easily just transduce the cells with a single guide RNA or Cas9. And in, in the animal models, as I've shown, um, so it's also pretty easy. You can induce these... Um, uh, basically you can introduce these um, uh, gene editing materials into your target cells. Um, but if you want to apply this to human, um, I, I think that the, the key thing is that first, the specificity of the targeting, basically which cells you want to target, or you don't want to target some irrelevant cells. If you are, let's say, if you're treating a lung cancer, you want to target your immune cells or some cells that you want it to maintain in this process. Um, and also um, which gene you want to target and how efficient the targeting um, is um, um, by using the CRISPR. That we know that um, um, some, in some cases, the efficiency of the knockout or uh, genetic, in, uh, genetic editing uh, is different. Uh, some can be pretty high with high efficiency. Some can be unfortunately low because of the position of the gene in the chromosome, sometimes it just can be hard, it's just hard to really efficiently knock out some genes. So, um, but I believe that that's also under investigation. Um, so, um, and um, there's a pretty uh, bright hope um, in efficiently targeting these genes uh, using this tool. Yeah. Um, I will question. also add too, in, uh, in cell culture, a lot of people do like to use um, lentiviruses. So it's a specific type of virus. And this is because um, the virus actually allows for the single guide RNA to be stably integrated into the DNA of the host cell. And so there are some other mechanisms that researchers can use, in particular in cell culture models. Um, however, uh, not all of those mechanisms allow for the single guide to be stably integrated into the DNA. And so uh, it could potentially be lost, um, which would impact, obviously, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system working properly. Yeah, so so one comment on top of that. So if you're not familiar with lentivirus, um, so this is kind of a safe, um, more like a safe tool uh, that we use. Um, so it basically is a virus that can deliver the um, genomic um, or genetic information into the host stably, but are not able to replicate uh, later on. Um, so basically you're not really being infected. <laughs> Um, but uh, you're not really producing more and more active virus um, um, that can cause a disease. But I, yeah, but I mean, there are many different ways that you can deliver the CRISPR and single guide RNA, not just virus, but you can also use the um, lipid, um, uh, lipid structures. I think we might have time for one more. And Matt is asking, on a macro level, what does CRISPR look like? What machines or techniques are used to create CRISPR material? So that is a really good question. Um, so kind of on a macro level, um, I mean, for me, I always kind of visualize it as, in some sense, kind of that earlier slide I was showing you about how it was originally discovered in bacteria. And so you can kind of think of it as like uh, you have a protein and then you have a single guide RNA. So you have, I don't know, the protein you can kind of, I kind of visualize it as like a, 
uh, almost like a circular like blob or component. And then the single guide RNA is more like a strand. Um, and so those two components, I kind of visualize those taken out of bacteria and then put into another system, such as a human cell. And so I don't know if that's quite getting at your question, um, but it's just kind of how I think about it. Shannon, I don't know if you have any other things to add here. That's pretty much, yeah. I think the question might actually be getting into like, what kinds of equipment do you use and machines and I see. things um, like so, that? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the, um, the, the way that we, um, we, we, we use CRISPR, um, so I think that really also goes back to the transduction. So it's so, the so way that we use them like, yeah, basically you have to really introduce these components to the cell to let it make the single guide RNA or basically to express single guide RNA and Cas9 for the snack out. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if I really understand the question. Um, you could say in a human cell culture model, uh, the components that you would need are actual human cells. So for example, in the example I gave, um, we needed lung cancer cells um, that were sensitive to the drug or latinib um, and that also expressed the Cas9 protein. And so that was one component. And then we also needed a library of the single guide RNAs that could then be introduced into the cells. Um, once those two things are there, the single guide RNAs and the Cas9 protein, um, the single guide RNA will then direct the Cas9 protein um, to the specific gene that you want to, in our case, knock out and allow that gene editing to happen, where you, the Cas9 will create the double strand break and then the repair introducing lethal mutations that end up making that gene non-functional. All right. Uh, Chenin and Jenna are going to stick around, um, but we're going to take a quick five minute break. Um, before you run away, if you have not renamed yourself yet, um, can you please hover over your image, click the three little dots and rename yourself and put an E, an M or an H in front of your name so we know if you're elementary, middle or high school, so that we can put you into appropriate breakout rooms when we get back. So we will see you at 540 sharp. Yeah, hi, Shannon and uh, Jenna. Thank you for doing this. This is great. Um, two summers ago, I had an opportunity up at uh, Cornell University to work in uh, Professor uh, Nicotin's lab. And we made a, um, it was an eight week sort of scientist teacher collaboration. And uh, we made a, uh, a knock and mouse and it was really super cool. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, we were we were looking at a at a gene tech STU2 that made trope two. Um, and so yeah, it was it was kind of neat to actually see it through to the end. He sent me we actually got it to work and he sent me pictures about a month later of the mouse. So <laughs> but uh he said, "We have our mice," and uh, but it was it was really interesting. I, it's funny. I mean, I was at at school, and I'm like, "Oh, I wish I could do this at school." But I think that's what the question earlier was talking about. Like, what machines do you need? You know, like PCRs and incubators, and you know, vents, and you know, um, I just you know wouldn't have access to any of that. You know, at at my school. I mean, I got you know, a little gel electrophoresis machine. And I, I, I think I'm lucky, you know? So, um, but anyways, it was, it was super fun and super interesting. I felt really stupid most of the time working around guys like you. Um, and I had the, um, he was, he was, he was so patient. Uh, his, his, he was a PhD student and it was Danish Avatov and he, um, he was so patient with me. He would like explain to me in great detail what we were doing um, and try to bring it down to my level. But um, a lot of it was 
uh, over my head. He let me do all the protocols though, which was kind of neat. And uh, he made me keep a notebook and write them all down. So it was, it was <laughs> um, but anyways, it was very enjoyable. I wish they would do more stuff like that with the other colleges around, you know, um, it was a lot of fun. Well, thank you for that. We really appreciate it. And that's really cool. You've had those other experiences too at Cornell. Um, that's really great. So we're happy we could add to that a little bit. Yeah. It's so cool to hear that. And I mean, I'm really also very fascinated about just such a diverse application of the CRISPR, not just knock out a gene, but you, you also mentioned knock in. And also you can I mean, you can basically model many, many, many different situations that you can find in human disease. So yeah, it really, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, they had, they had, I mean, I, I got to see other labs too, which was really neat. You know, some were working with worms and zebrafish and they had, you know, they must have had a thousand tanks of zebrafish there in this one lab. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. actually I was able to get like a whole zebrafish set up um, and I was going to breed them and try and do like genetic things with them with the kids. Cause I could do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I can't get a PCR machine from my classroom, but I can get a zebra fish. So, um, but then as soon as we got them going, COVID hit and that, that was, that was the end of my, I still have the fish. They're very happy swimming around, but, um, we haven't done any breeding with them yet, but anyways, maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds exciting. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. It's 540, so I'm going to get started to try to keep us on track here uh, so we can finish on time. Um, so we are going to go into breakout rooms now uh, for an activity. And what we've done is uh, kind of utilize some of the resources from PBS uh, Learning Media uh, for the gene. And within there, there are scenarios that you can actually use with your students. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, so you are going to have access to all of these scenarios as soon as that link gets popped into the chat window for me. Um, and so you're going to be assigned to a particular breakout group. So it'll be important to recognize what breakout group you get assigned to. So you're going to be either group 1A scenario 1 or group 4B scenario 4. So there is a document within that folder that will correspond to your group number. And when you open up that document, it'll be editable. And you will see a particular scenario. And what you're going to do over the next 35 to 40 minutes or so um, is to work with your group and think about how would you um, teach us in your class? How would you go about uh, uh, working with your students? Um, so kind of almost creating like an informal lesson plan of sorts uh, for this particular scenario. Um, you might want to think about how you would introduce uh, the scenario, what activities you might need to lead up to it, um, things of that nature. Um, and certainly work through the scenario yourself and kind of come up with some of your ideas. And, uh, and this uh, folder is going to be a standing repository that you all will have access to even after uh, this uh, workshop ends. And, uh, and so please, uh, you know, utilize it um, and take a look at what other groups do. There are a series of resources that have been posted on the bottom that you can refer to. Um, certainly use the links that uh, Jenna created um, as additional resources. And you're certainly welcome to use anything that you have access to um, in your discussions. So you'll be in groups of four to five people um, is there any questions before I send you to your breakout room? All right, well, have fun. Um, all of us are going to kind of be circulating through the room. So Chanin, Jenna, Jeff, uh, Maureen, uh, myself, 
Um, but if you have any questions or if you want to pull someone into your room to add, um, uh, to discuss uh, what you're working on with, feel free to send me a message and then we can get someone into your room. So without further ado, I'm going to open the breakout rooms and send you off. All right, well, welcome back everybody. Um, I hope that was uh, a productive um, time. Um, we have a few minutes, so I'd love to hear, we're not gonna be able to hear from every group, but I'd love to hear some of the conversations that you had. So if there's any groups willing to speak up, and I have to apologize ahead of time, I realized my breakout room numbers, some of them got messed up, it didn't match the doc numbers, so I apologize to those groups that that happened to. Um, it made the breakout rooms too fast. <laughs> so, um, but is there any groups that would be willing to share what they talked about and what their, which scenario they had? And Sure, I'll, I'll just summarize real quick. Thank you. Um, we had the group 1A scenario. It concerned uh, Zika virus um, and um, releasing mosquitoes that through the CRISPR model, uh, if I understand correctly, have been sterilized. Um, and somehow that will die down the virus. And we were just kind of first figuring out what we were teaching, what, what course would this best apply to, uh, and then coming up with ideas that would be a good anchor, like the World Cup soccer in Brazil and the Zika outbreak, the microcephaly, um, and mentioning um, the female scientist, Jeff, uh, Jennifer Doutna and her book and her TED talk. Spider-Man was mentioned. And uh, we came up with a debate about the methodology of how to combat uh, the virus, and and then we and then we talked about COVID. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it usable in your classroom? Um, I would say AP Bio because it's um, pretty pretty intense um, ma background material. So maybe after the AP exams. I I, I don't know about biology. And we also had a physics uh, teacher in our group and didn't quite know how to address that. Okay. Other groups? Uh, because I'm a physics teacher, I'd like to go next. Um, <laughs> we had an article about uh, gene editing and for IVF treatments, um, but we got really off topic when Jenna joined our group and that led us to basically just using our assignment as a jumping off point and then you know, having an open-ended open -ended assignment that our students can kind of research anything with genetic engineering that interests them, whether it's, you know, something with GMO food or cancer research or, yeah, you know, whatever it is for them. And then making a, maybe like a brief presentation where they can share that back with the group. Um, you know, and, and these days with COVID, we were discussing what does that look like? So we're talking about maybe making like a a screencastify where maybe they can show us their evidence and then make their argument verbally, you know, especially if they don't want to appear in front of camera. So anyway, uh, for us, it, it became so open-ended that that was kind of our logical conclusion. Nice. Other groups. I could go. Thank you. We basically came up with a sequence with a lot of flexibility within it. We thought we'd start with, uh, if you're reading the scenario, like a no think wonder, what information is in there? What does it make you think about? And what background knowledge do you need to know to think through it? With the idea being kind of helping kids identify what science they need to know. So then we give them the lectures at their level, it's what they were looking for. Um, and then bring in an article, maybe on designer babies, um, and then hold a discussion. And we had all kinds of directions that discussion could focus. One that kept coming up was a focus on athletics, uh, partly because there's already the um, parameters on doping. It's kind of an idea of modifying your athleticism and ethical responses to it. So it was a nice parallel. But there was lots of things we talked about. And then, of course, ending with um, some sort of uh, student opinion piece. That's it. Nice. See, Libby popped in. Uh, they had scenario three. We thought 
uh, have kids make a list of genetic disorders and rank them from worst <laughs> you're dead to man that sucks so you'll live as a start since we didn't think um, they would have much background or personal experience on that <laughs> and uh, Mark mentioned we thought we could use scenario four as an introduction to our genetics unit to get a debate going uh, maybe uh, a virtual debate using Jamboard perhaps which we looked at a lot last time Maybe time for one more group. So I'll give our group. It was um, 2B scenario two, and it was about the, um, sorry about that. It was about the liver um, issues, like a person with genetic liver disease who would die from it. Um, and we made it as um, a hospital group getting together and discussing like whether or not they would do this offering, you know, give, give the kids different roles like the accountant role, the patient role, the, the uh, you know, doctor's role and let them kind of figure and give them some background information for each issue and have them discuss on whether or not they should be offering that or not. Nice. So I'm just gonna share real quickly one more time for just a second, just to remind you um, that there are tons of resources um, in PBS uh, leaning, uh, learning media that are free. Um, there's various activities, there's videos, uh, tons of support materials. Um, so certainly uh, check you know, all of this out um, if you're looking for things to do with your students. Um, but I think that's gonna wrap up the content portion of our uh, discussion this evening. And Nancy, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kind of do the wrap up and uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, some of you have been here all four nights, both the webinar uh, and the workshop. Some of you came for the workshop. So uh, it's been great working with all of you. So Nancy. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, such a great workshop. I'd like to thank Chenin and Jenna. Uh, it was really fascinating to hear about your, your work and share what you've done. It was really awesome. Um, I did pop in the chat a survey. Can you please just take a moment to take this survey? And it's very helpful to our funders who help to support uh, this work and be able to bring this to you. So please take a moment, open that link up. Even if you don't do it right now, you can come back and, and finish it after, after you eat or, or whatever. I'd like to thank all of our presenters, uh, Dominic Fanicone, uh, Jeff Radloff, Aaron Deegan, who's here with us tonight, Jessica Schindler, and Maureen Smith, who presented on Tuesday. And I think they've shared some wonderful resources. And I wanna thank you for spending the time with us during these workshops. Uh, WSKG will be re-airing The Gene in February on two Sundays. And that will be, I think, February 5th. What month is, are we on? Yes, February 7th and 14th at 6 p.m. But you can again watch the entire documentary on PBS Learning Media. All of the resources uh, will are have been shared, but they will also be sent out to you. Uh, we have recorded both of these sessions, and those will be sent out as well. Um, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I will be contacting some of you for prizes, especially if you attended all four sessions. I do have some goodies that we will be sharing, including the four-hour documentary. And I have some 23 in me kits that we're going to mail out. So if you see me pop into your inbox, please um, reply so that I can give those things out to you for participating. Uh, Derek, yes, the cat genetic material is coming. Uh, Dr. Fumira did send that to me. So that will be coming as well. Um, and, the, and the lesson that she had created. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your support. And we hope that you have a great evening. Good night, everyone.